Live from Studio 5, I'm Pam Daniels. And behind the camera is... Brandon. We are I'm so Brandon. glad you've decided to join us. This is um, our on-campus studio where we teach at Northwestern University and try to engage students in our lively design practice, um, sort of showing them what it's like to, to endure the messy, playful process that is design. So we're thrilled that you joined us. Um, as promised, we're going to kind of walk you through the process of how we landed on the final design of measure. Maybe not final, the current design of measure. So this is what the um, this is what the measuring cups look like now. This is what the Kickstarter campaign is for. This is a prototype. This is not a production um, sample. This is not in mass production. There are two of these in the world, two sets of these in the world. Um, and we're going to go through the story of how we got to here. How did we get to now? So um, the very first prototype, I guess, was a sketch. It was a sketch that I did while I was still in grad school. I guess the topic wasn't captivating my interest, and I started doodling and started wondering why measuring cups um, all looked like the whole circle, and thinking about pie charts and wondering why the measuring cups didn't look like pie charts. So these are the measuring cups that I actually have in my kitchen. I imagine many of you have similar looking measuring cups. They're metal. They've lasted really well. But once you take them out of the nested set, it becomes very difficult to distinguish like which one's a quarter, which one's a third. It's not very easy to tell. Um, and so I started wondering, would it be possible to design measuring cups that actually looked like the form that they represented in, in a pie chart type of thing? And so um, I love using SolidWorks to model things. And uh, so the very first iteration was this, probably hard to see on the backdrop, not even in focus, Let's see. Um, with these, these measuring cups that were made on a MakerBot, um, a 3D printer that I have. Santa bought a MakerBot one year. It was a good year for Christmas. And um, so it indeed was possible. So the question, I guess, at that point was, would it be possible to make cups that were volumetrically accurate and look like the shape that they represent? And you see them. Um, waving them in the light so you can see those shapes. So they are totally not manufacturable nor desirable necessarily. They're super deep volume, super straight walls. You can't manufacture something with perfectly straight walls and perfectly square corners, but you can 3D print it. Um, and so that sort of answers the question of, huh, yeah, okay, that's doable. I wonder how we should hand approach the handles was kind of the next question because zero consideration in this prototype was given to the handles. So um, it was just stick a hand, any old handle on there. But then the question was like, oh, should they be on the left side, the right side? Here we have the half cup on the left side, the third cup on the right side, and then the um, quarter cup on the left again. So that was kind of version one. Then um, the second prototype was these. These were made on an Ultimaker 3D printer the two plus if you're interested in 3D printing and exactly what we're talking about. And ironically, these were inspired by the brand Joseph Joseph, which the design of measure has been favorably compared to Joseph Joseph's measuring cups. And it's a brand I love. It's a brand I've always loved. They're in the MoMA store. I've admired their work for years. And, and sort of one of the avenues that was interesting to explore would be if we license these to Joseph Joseph as opposed to bringing them forward and seeing them through the manufacturing piece ourselves, what would Joseph Joseph do? And so that was the color. And they do really gorgeous, yummy pops of color. These are actually the measuring cups that were featured in the 477 article that Rain Noe has, if I'm saying that name right. Um, and so they, so this was just kind of a, a leap forward, I guess, in the design because this, the handles are all centered now. So there's one prominent handle and they all nest and they're centered, which was no small feat to accomplish by keeping them volumetrically accurate. But if you stack them, they, they don't really stay in place. They kind of slap around a little bit. Um, and the, the other thing that I suppose was being explored with these was, do you need indications? Is that the purpose? I don't know how well you can see that, but there are raised indications of the volume of measure, let's say a quarter cup, a third a cup, half cup, one cup. Um, so there is some playing with even what's that typeface? Um, and should it be raised? Should it be sunken? Um, 
what do you want that to look like? But this got us a little bit closer. Um, but the, actually, the handles on these are rather sharp. They're not filleted enough. They're not rounded enough to feel great in the hand. And so then the next thing that was explored was making them fatter and chunkier. These feel great. Not really sure that they're injection moldable. Works well on a 3D printer, but you can't really have hollow cavities inside of a manufactured um, injection molded plastic piece. But it, it was an exploration. There's lots of exploration with the design. And then I think the next version, which is the first one we actually took to the manufacturing partner um, for their assessment of the design and what some design considerations should be as we refine it, was this version. So this version um, has holes in, in the bottom. It's pretty conventional to include holes in measuring cups, though not always. Um, this set, for instance, that we just showed from Joseph Joseph has a hole only in the top one, and then they all kind of click together. Um, spoons tend to have holes as well, um, but we, in our, so we were curious, what would it be like if we included a spoon? But if you look at this set, and if I take it apart for you, they're sort of inset for each version. The quarter cup is nudged a little bit over from the third cup, etc. And so the hole that's a perfect circle on the top one is a little bit more of a rectangle, a little bit more of a rectangle, and then a little bit even bigger of a rectangle in the bottom. Um, and then there's an extrusion, which is going to be really hard for you to see. But essentially, this, this um, rim around the circle extends below the base of the handle. And that was sort of a nesting function. So that was being explored in this one. How would we keep them in place? And is the whole important were kind of the questions we were addressing through this prototype. Um, so that is what we have there. And then what did we try next? Oh, and this, I'm gonna take this back for a second. This is the point at which we met with um, Patricia and Vince at Matrix 4, which is the manufacturing partner here in Chicago that we've identified that we'd like to work with. So um, we ran this by them. We are really big fans of engaging with manufacturers early in the process so that they can help inform the design and tell us, you know, that's not gonna be, uh, that's gonna be hard to get the, the resin to flow in it with the way you've designed it. You need to add this, you need to take this away, or, oh, those little extrusions on the bottom are gonna cause a lot of these to fail. We didn't know, we had no idea what um, they would say. It turns out there really weren't too many concerns with this design, but it was a great touch point to start engaging the manufacturing partner in the design process to make sure that it was indeed being designed in a way that was manufacturable. And then, um, the next thing that was considered, I think, correct me if I'm wrong at any point here, Brandon, but I think the next thing we started playing with was trying to get um, optical clarity. So we had, you, if you look at the ones I just showed you, they're sort of beach glassy. So these were printed in clear resin on a Formlabs printer. If you haven't checked out a Formlabs printer, we'll post a link afterward. It, it looks like something out of Terminator. It's a vat of goo and the goo gets hit with light and that sort of drags the shape up from out of the goo. It sounds crazy, it works, it's really, it's really neat. Like I said, we'll post a video. But once you sand it at all and, and take it out, even though you've used clear resin, it really comes out rather cloudy. And so we weren't really jazzed about that and wanted to try to get it more clear. And so then we did a lot of online research and found that if you actually take the, um, form that you've created using clear resin on a form labs printer and dip it once again in the resin, then you can um, get something that approaches optical clarity. So these are not bad, but if you if I let the light shine, they're kind of goopy because the resin's uh, pretty thick, it's pretty viscous. Um, so it, you know, this was close, but I don't think we'd really want to be photographing a set that looks like that. So we kept, we kept at it. Um, the next things we started exploring, so if you look at these, the handles are still really flat. Um, there's no, we, we're not nesting anymore. We've sort of gone back a step, I suppose, in the design process from having those extrusions on the bottom of the handle actually create the nesting. And now we're back to totally flat, no nesting, um, and started wondering if it were possible to add a curve to the handle and omit the hole, what would that be like? And so we played with just the handle for a little bit. 
these look kind of like popsicle sticks to me, but we just started printing without wasting all the 3D printer filament on an Ultimaker again, printing these um, handles and starting to explore what the shape could be. And then when we felt kind of okay about that, we decided to go for it with the entire uh, form. So these are a couple samples of that form. Now has a slight curvature in the handle. If you look, I'll hold it against the black to make sure I can do that on the screen. If you can see that. But there's um, a slight curvature right here, kind of scooping, so that when you set them down, they stay. So, and then the other thing, you can see this one, the cast, the color looks a little bit different. We were also a little bit intrigued by what it might be like to have green, um, green glass. We we're surrounded in this building, in the Ford building, by glass that has a green tint to it. It's very common and we like it. And so we thought, well, what if we added a little green tint? So this was another thing we were looking at. And then if you look at the labeling, another question throughout the process is what should the do you need an indicator at all on the measuring cup or is the shape so clear that you really don't even need an indicator? Um, my teaching partner for UX design felt very strongly that you do not need the indicator. We had a very fun debate about it one day. Um, but a lot of users we talked to said, no, really give us something. Just help us out a little bit. So we started experimenting with different ways to help people out with that unit of measure. And one of the things that was um, suggested, a different teaching partner actually suggested um, showing the pie chart. So I'd be probably not going to be able to see that, but there's essentially one quarter sort of popped up from the circle on the bottom of this one showing you that it's a quarter and likewise a third on this. And when we put these in front of people, they just sort of said, well, that doesn't really tell me anything that the shape itself doesn't tell me. I think a fraction might be more useful. So fractions came back. Um, Oh, I guess they didn't come back yet. So here's a green set. I think we can gloss over that. But now we've got this sli um, sloping on the handle in order for it to stay nested. We've got it in green, super fun. If you want to hit us up about how do you turn these into green, it's alcohol dyes were very effective. It's a lot of fun to try doing this. Um, but then I wasn't really keen on this aspect of the design, which is that when I looked at these cups visually, I felt like my eye wasn't really sure where to go. Should it go to this kind of cavity here or should it go to this cavity here? And my eyes kept doing this kind of um, insanity loop and I didn't, I, I just, it didn't feel quite right yet to me. And so then the next um, exploration was what if we inverted that curvature on the handle so that it curved going this way and the entire top of the handle were able to remain flat and the underside took the, um, you know, is where the curvature was. And then uh, it was looking at fractions as well. It turns out these are called, you probably can't see them very well again, sorry, stacked fractions when it looks like a math book. Um, so instead of the one slash four, that was the case on this pink form, one with a diagonal slash and then the four, decided that my preference, what looked cleaner to me was a stacked fraction. And I spent eight hours looking for the exact typeface on here. That's what designers do with really fun and a little um, distressing to our spouses, perhaps. Um, but this is what they look like sort of at that next iteration. This is the final version that um, Brandon and I were able to polish the heck out of and try to get clear very unsuccessfully. And we ultimately gave up. We got the one that the handle actually was it's something resembling clear, but we were still a long ways off from this, which is a production sample. This is a, a, using the same type of BPA-free plastic resin that we will be using in production. It's called Eastman Triton. Um, and this is a, a glass that the same fabricator matrix for has, this is coming off their production lines. So clearly this doesn't, that look like this. And so we thought people aren't going to be able to make the leap from beach glass to this um, and say, oh, no, 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 it's going to be clear. Trust us, it'll be clear. We thought we really need to find a way to show clear. Um, and so from that prototype, then we have the ones that you see. And we actually sent these out to a firm in Chicago um, that they were also 3D printed and then really 
buffed by people who spent an awful lot of time polishing and sanding and buffing and then ultimately clear coating them in a lacquer, sort of like an automotive finish in order to achieve uh, this prototype that you see, which is the one that's featured in our Kickstarter um, video and on in all of the photos. So again, if you're joining us late, the, there are only two of these in the world right now. We could 3D print more. The beach glass ones are easy. The perfectly clear ones, not as easy. Um, but the, the Kickstarter uh, is to raise the funds in order to go to our first production run. That amount that we have set, which feels sort of high to raise, $20 at a time, is in fact what break even is. So by the time you pay for the tooling for the cups themselves, um, and then actually the production costs of each unit, $65,000 is actually what just breaks us even, and we don't pay ourselves, but we can ship them to everyone. So that, I think, is where I'm going to leave it and open it up um, to see if we have any questions. I'm happy to open it up to the, the audience out there. Cool. So one question we do have, uh, have you thought about how or if this design approach might extend to school? Yes. There are actually prototypes right over here. Not ready to show any of those prototypes yet, but yes. The um, thought is that if we are successful in funding this Kickstarter, we, we want to be able to have the patent um, filed for by the time the Kickstarter is over, which is uh, approaching fast. But prototypes keep um, coming out for those. And yes, I think it's a logical extension. And for those of you who are concerned about the hole, we will have a hole in the spoons because people seem to like to keep them um, together in a drawer. They like to generally keep them on the, the, you know, the connector that they came with, whatever that connector looks like. But we did not find that to be the case for the spoon. So we let go of the, the hole for the cups, but we will definitely be including a hole and send them clasped together for the spoon. And then so far, only one other question. Uh, Mike is wondering if if we don't need the funding on Kickstarter, if there's an alternate. Yes, we've had some thoughts about that since we hit the go live button. You can't change your goal once you go live, nor can you change your ending date, as you probably know. Um, but I don't think we will let the idea go. There's been interest expressed in getting this in distribution already from some retailers, which is really exciting. Um, in retrospect, we probably should have privately raised half of the money and then just used the Kickstarter as a way to build excitement and enthusiasm and raise some of the funds because it would have been an easier goal to hit. But um, I think the educators in us, because that is our <laughs> one big piece of our roles, is as educators, this is what it takes. And so we wanted to present a pure story of this is what it takes to bring this product to market. So might have been stupid, but that's why we, we went with it. But we, I think we will um, see that these get forward in the market because there's enough interest and resonance for the idea. Great question. As of now, there are no other questions. No other questions. Unless anybody wants to chime in with one. Um, do we have any read of how many people are out there? Do we have any metrics? Currently 27. 27, OK. Um, I wish I could ask questions. Maybe I can, can and then you can type, can type, you can type questions yeah. back. So I'm curious for the people who are backing this campaign, sort of what the interest is for you. Is it, are you primarily interested because you're really into cooking? Are you design fans? And you like, this is a great design. I really never cook. I'm a kit, kit person and an order out person, but I think they're neat. But I'd love to hear some of the perspective of, I guess, what's bringing people in. Gonna get tricky if nobody answers. It's yeah. not like the classroom. <laughs> well, while we wait for that, we did get another question. Okay, great. What is Studio Five and what do you do there? Studio Five is the space that um, Brandon and I claimed when we were hired by Northwestern. So Brandon and I met each other in grad school. We both did graduate degrees in design here at Northwestern University. And by Brandon graduated uh, six months before I did, but when he graduated, um, well, somewhere in there, we, we decided, we kind of fell into teaching. Yeah. We said yes to a teaching gig for high schoolers for the summer, a three-week design intensive, and kind of decided we really liked it, even though that hadn't been an interest either of us had expressed in grad school. That wasn't why we were going to grad school. But we formed a design practice together. And um, when we were, when we had graduated and started, identified that teaching was interesting to us, we were approached by Northwestern University to actually um, take on full-time roles here and to teach in the design program. But it was kind of an impulsive decision, I think. 
And so there was no, uh, they didn't know where to put us. So we were told, it's a great story actually. We were told, um, if you take one of those breakout rooms on the ground floor and make it look okay by the time the dean gets back, you can probably stay in there. That's actually what we were told. Um, so we have this space on campus. It used to just be a uh, whiteboard, white one like kind of chalkboardy whiteboard and another chalkboardy whiteboard on the wall over there and a round table and five or six chairs in the middle. Um, and we, we have turned it into our studio. So pretty much over two intense weeks before school was in session, we um, designed and built the, the bookcase that you see back here, sort of inspired by Jeannie Gang's uh, Aqua Tower in Chicago. We love the curves on that building and the sort of organic form that it gives to the city in contrast to all the angular shapes. And so we thought we could use a sculptural element. I actually have a mirror. I just happened to have thought of the idea of, um, I can show you Brandon. So you can wave Brandon. I think if I can aim the mirror, like, there's Brandon. Hi. There's the uh, Studio 5 sign um, and our wall. So I'm just going to give you a quick little view. Well, that's not very good to work. Okay, I'm going to go back this way. So we have a skyline in the window. We are right on the ground floor of the Ford uh, Design Building at Northwestern's, Northwestern University's campus. Um, and Studio 5, the name Studio 5 came up because Brandon one day just looked over at me early, early in the days of Studio 5, before it was Studio 5, and asked, how do you feel about the number 5? Just out of the blue, how do you feel about the number 5? It's one of the reasons I love working with Brandon. And, um, and I said, good, I feel okay about 5. I came from a family of 5, 5 digits on a hand, I like 5. And he had found this uh, sign that he really liked, a vintage sign. And um, so he said, I like the sign. And I kind of, I think slightly, was I discreet? Like, where did you, where did yeah. you find this sign? And uh, he told me, and I knew where it was, and I just went and got it. And so that sign, I'll show you again. Pull up my mirror. Super handy to have a mirror. That sign is right there. So that five is sort of what we christened this space um, as Studio 5. Instead of the room that used to be the breakout room on the ground floor, we didn't think that was a catchy name. So Studio 5 it is. All right, we got another question Great. Uh, from Stephen. Yes, if we have any thoughts about continuing this idea of more intuitive measurement and extending mm -hmm. it to other products, potentially for weight. Ooh, intrigued. I'm wondering, that was Stephen? Yep. Can you tell us a little bit more, Stephen? What kinds of things would you want to uh, measure by weight? I'm picturing a scale I stand on, and I don't think I want to be told I'm a person in half. So that's where my head is. <laughs> I would assume in the kitchen. He said ounces, grams. Ounces, so grams. Not pounds. Okay, got it. Necessarily, but. Um, I'm not sure. I'd be curious to explore that a little bit more. My sense is that uh, the U.S. is kind of the holdout country that still even uses this form of measure. I think really serious bakers weigh things anyway. Um, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to diminish the people who, I don't want to call you a serious or not serious baker, but I know many bakers, commercial bakers in particular, um, tend to weigh ingredients and many people in Europe tend to weigh ingredients. I'm less clear about what happens elsewhere. But um, I think if there are applications, I think it would be really interesting. I think one of our drives as a practice is how do we make everything more, more user-centered? How do we create designs that are respectful to the people they're meant to serve? How do we make life better through design in, in any sort of even fractional marginal way? How do we bring delight? How do we bring greater usability? How do we make things more intuitive? Those are sort of the questions that drive designers. So very open to ideas that you might have of other particular places you'd like to see this apply. Cool, and then we did hear back from one person on the chat, Amanda. She just said that I hate measuring and trying to read the numbers on the handles. So anything that makes it easier is awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. That's how we feel. <laughs> Definitely how we feel. Um, one other thing I'll just sort of throw in there in, in, while we're waiting for another question to come across is one of the things we consider so <laughs> design. One of my, my well, my all time favorite designer is Dieter Rums. There's a documentary coming up about him funded on Kickstarter. So um, that's exciting. But Dieter Rums, uh, talked about design being really um in all like all of the facets of design being really well thought of so one of the the things we thought about this is an oxo set of measuring cups we did a fair amount of looking at what's 
already out there and if anyone had already solved the problem that we were setting out to solve. And one of the, the flaws we felt with this design, the great thing is they have magnets, so they stay together in your door. They're not going to come apart. But they're really tall. And the actual um, use case for measuring cups is that people tend to keep them in the drawer in the kitchen. And these are too tall to actually even fit in a drawer. So if I hold these up, see, I'll try to do this evenly. So ours are like two measuring cups shorter than, than the ones you see here. So I think trying to think about design in all of its facets and really being deeply human-centered about not just designing in a vacuum what would be cool measuring cups, but when people take these home and they use them and they're um, in their kitchens, what are how, how high is a typical kitchen drawer? Will these fit? Will these fit? Um, and looking at all those considerations is, is a part of what I particularly really enjoy about the design process getting that granular and that um, contextual about the way that a thing is used. Anything else? Okay. Seems to be quiet on the other side. We might call it a day with that one then. We're really grateful for everyone who tuned in. We're excited for all of our backing. Um, we've, we've had a good day today and we hope that you will continue to tell people about Measure. We'll only um, be able to do this, as you know, if we hit our fully funded level. Kickstarter is all or nothing. So if you're an impoverished student, tell your parents, tell your parents to tell their friends um, so that these will be in the market when you have uh, money to spend again and you're able to stock your first kitchen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.